Well, the scripture says that when, uh, when you are victorious, we will give shouts of joy. And that's how I feel about Eddie Hobgood, deep in my soul. Uh, to, to see your family this morning is... <laughs> You'll hear his testimony tomorrow night. And this will make a bit more sense. <laughs> but uh, Eddie was with us. We lived in community there in London for eight weeks together. So I've heard a bit of my brother's story. And uh, just to see, I know we're on a journey. I'm not trying to put pressure on you guys, but it's like, you know, perfection. I'm not saying that. I know better. But just we see a lot of grace on your household. And we are, you are victorious, and we are giving shouts of joy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Mighty to save. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Have good family. Bless you guys. Thank you. In his presence, <clears throat> the place where God dwells, a home for our homeless God. We've done these two so far, and today we look at God moving into the neighborhood. Thanks for the Mr. Rogers song. That was a great idea. <laughs> That's really good. I never think we could use it at the mercy seat, right? Won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> and uh, whoops, our questions that we're reflecting on throughout the week, really. Uh, today, especially, we're going to think about the idea of how far will God go to be at home with us? Thinking about the incarnation, which if you're not familiar with that term, uh, you might know from Spanish, right? Carne, meat. In flesh, the enfleshment of God, God coming in the flesh as a human being. And I want to mention something that I didn't learn until quite recently, um, that when, when Jesus Christ, who is eternally God, he's the uncreated God of the universe, he's the begotten Son of God, but he's also one with God, Father, Son, Spirit. When he came in the flesh, that was forever, no going back. He is, he is eternally human as well. So how far will God go? We'll explore this a bit further. And again, I think we're hearing the message, the strangest thing about the Bible is God, that he wants to be with us. So I hope that you take that with you really the rest of your lives as you read the scriptures, uh, to look at that, uh, look at it through that lens and you'll see it. We're only touching on it, uh, you know, briefly really, these days together, but it's, it permeates the scriptures really from, Genesis to Revelation, if you just look at it the rest of your life with that lens, about God, God's relentless pursuit of human beings. So yeah, we're thinking this morning especially about how far will God go to make his home with us. So remember uh, Moses said, show me your glory. And interestingly, show me your face, show me your glory. Uh, and God's answer to that was, I'll show you my goodness. So Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God says, yes, I will show you my goodness. It's kind of an unusual response there, right? And so whenever we think about the glory of God being manifest, showing up, it's the goodness of God being manifest. When we see the goodness of God, it's the glory of God showing up. And uh, Psalmist writes, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I want to encourage your heart this morning. Uh, are you looking for the goodness of the Lord? There are a bunch of things on my, if you will, my spiritual bucket list, but I want to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Like before I die, there's a number of things I'd like to see of the goodness of the Lord. I'll name a few. I would like to see revival hit the Salvation Army. Uh, a few years ago, the, Joe and Doris Nolan, Commissioners Nolan, were our territorial leaders in the USA Eastern Territory. And at the, uh, at the International Millennial Congress in 2000, that, they were our leaders then, our territorial leaders. And we had the, uh, our own, we all gathered by territories, right, uh, at that Congress. And uh, they had several sort of imaginings of what could happen, one of which was like a thousand cadets, you know, <laughs> waiting to get into the college and uh, opening fire on, uh, in outer space on other planets. And uh, there was a married woman, African-American general. Come on! <laughs> I hope that's not as far-fetched as going to the moon. 
So we're looking for the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In my lifetime, I want to see some things, and I hope you do too, right? Some things that like the Abraham and Sarah, the Isaac promises, you go, laughter, right? You go, really? Really? That's what's happening? That person came back from the dead? That core was alive again that was dead and now they're seeking after God? Really, that neighborhood is being transformed? Really, we're effectively reaching that particular community? I want to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. And the Lord says, yes, I will show you my goodness. And so we remember the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son. That's in the message. And then there it is amplified. The word became flesh, human, incarnate, tabernacled, fixed his tent of flesh, lived a while among us. So we're just going to uh, quickly go through the seven items in the tabernacle in the Old Testament and how we see Jesus as the fulfillment of each of them. We'll move quickly through these. Uh, in the tabernacle, there's the door, and of course, John 10, 9, Jesus was a Jew. He was a devout man of the book, right? He knew the scriptures. He would have understood exactly what he was saying. Although he was fully human, he laid aside all the privileges of his godness while incarnate. So we want to remember everything we see that Jesus did in the Gospels, he did as a human being. He did as a human being. So we, are, we see how to live. He reveals the nature of God, but what he did on earth, we can't say, oh, that's because he was God. No, he laid aside those privileges and he saw what the Father was doing. He listened by the Holy Spirit to what the Father was saying and that's how he operated out of uh, his obedience. And that is available to you and to me. So when he says, I am the door, that was not, he wasn't saying that because he was uh, omniscient, all-knowing. He was saying that because he'd been studying the scriptures as a devout man of faith, and the Spirit had whispered to him, this is you. He had, the Spirit had been giving Jesus revelation of his identity as Messiah. Second item in the tabernacle, the bread of the presence, of course. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. I so appreciated Helen's prayer. Feed us, feed us. Let's just sing that verse. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feed me till I want no more. Jesus, that's who we're singing to. Altar of incense, we see from Hebrews chapter seven. He is mighty to save. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Just want to encourage your heart this morning, whether it's for you or for someone else. If there's a, a little bit of doubt or you feel yourself wavering a bit, can God really save this person or me or really work in this community? Take heart from this verse in Hebrews chapter 7. He is able to save completely. He is the mighty to save. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. We have before the throne of the Father, Satan the accuser, who it says day and night accuses, he is the accuser of the brethren. And we also see Jesus, our high priest, who is always before the Father interceding on our behalf. So that's what's going on day and night, always happening, that Satan accusing us and saying, but they're this and they're that, and they're going to hell, and they're destined for death, and they're never getting out of this. And we have Jesus saying, forgive them, oh, forgive, I cry, nor let this ransom sinner die, right? The bleeding wounds, beautiful hymn. Jesus is uh, the mercy seat from Romans chapter 3. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. In the Salvation Army, we call this bench here a mercy seat. I actually love that name. Um, penitent form is nice too, as is holiness table. <laughs> but I really like mercy seat because who doesn't need mercy? Right? That's one of my favorite prayers. Uh, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Son of God, have mercy on me. Uh, I will say that my, my brother, my older brother, 
has taught me a lot about the mercy of God. He's, he's taught me to pray that way, uh, just asking God for your mercy. Like we come boldly, but we come boldly because of God's mercy, right? And so just whenever, both here and wherever you find yourself, just remember that Jesus is the mercy seat and it's, he's paid dearly to open the way for us. So see the mercy seat in your own setting, if you would, and here, as a beautiful thing, as a beautiful thing. I wanna run to the mercy seat, right? I wanna rush to the mercy of God. I wanna apprehend to receive everything he has died to provide. And uh, sometimes that's our, our place of receiving of the mercy of God. It's beautiful, I love it. It's our communion in some sense, right? Where we go and uh, it's a means of grace and I wanna take advantage of it. And I made a determination in my heart years ago that if the word that was spoken through the preaching or by whatever means applied to me and the invitation was given, if ba -da -da -da, this relates to you, I invite you now to come to the mercy seat that I would go. Uh, sometimes it's been inconvenient, sometimes I've argued with myself in my head saying, you're sitting on the platform or you're doing this or you know whatever kind of reason, or maybe the delivery wasn't even that interesting, but the application, <laughs> The application is apt, right? I need this, and so that's my commitment before the Lord, that if the invitation is something that relates to me and is given, the word, the word relates to me and invitation is given, I'm going to the mercy seat. Uh, humble yourself before God, right? And he'll lift you up. I don't wanna have, what, you know, what am I? I'm nothing, so are, like we're nothing. And yet we're the children of the most high God, right? It's like that's yes and yes. <laughs> Both those things are true. So I just wanna keep my heart low, and I'm always, I wanna always be willing to get on my knees. Jesus is the basin, John 13. He said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And of course, Peter, our lovely extroverted apostle. <laughs> then wash all of me, Lord. First, no, don't touch, don't wash me at all. Then wash everything. <laughs> Bless you, Peter. And then the lampstand, John chapter eight. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I love, I think it's in uh, 1 Corinthians, it says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel. They cannot see the light of the gospel. But, uh, but then it says that we have seen uh, the light of the gospel in the face of Christ. God has torn away the veil from our eyes so that we are able to see the light of the gospel, the glory of God in the face of of Christ. First chapter of Ephesians, Paul prays, open the eyes of our hearts that we would see you. In other words, give us more light. Jesus, give us more light. You are the light of the world. Increase our revelation. Increase our understanding of who you are. And then uh, the veil here in Hebrews chapter 10, the seventh and final item. Uh, by a new and living way, the veil, the curtain has been opened. That is his body which was torn, remember, at the uh, Good Friday, the day of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The veil in the temple, God the Father giving a dramatic illustration of the truth of this. The, tor the curtain was torn from top to bottom at the moment that Jesus breathed his last. He's opened a new and living way for us by his own body, the curtain which has been torn, opening the way for us into the Holy of Holies. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Don't you just love him? Do you love him now more than did you like five minutes ago? <laughs> that's how I feel. I love him again. Is it a tent in the neighborhood or the glory of God? That's one of those yes. A multiple choice questions, is it A or B? Yes. <laughs> it's both of those. Well, anybody love, anybody a doctrine geek here? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Let me just have your hand up. <laughs> it's okay to admit it. <laughs> uh, doctrine, this is a great doctrine, although I will tell you right now my favorite one is Doctrine 6. <laughs> but this is a great one too. <laughs> uh, let's read it out loud together. Doctrine 4, are you ready? Let's read. We believe. We believe. I remember preaching on this uh, years ago. I was in youth, the youth department in Massachusetts in the early 90s, and I preached that Good Friday on this um, doctrine. 
<clears throat> and the, uh, there was a core officer then in Roxbury, Massachusetts, uh, where there's now a croc center, <laughs> and uh, Major Cliff Yearwood, who is from Panama, who's a giant of a man, about six foot five or six. Yeah, he was a very tall guy. <laughs> Uh, full of the Holy Spirit. When he would come to DHQ, we could hear him come, like as soon as the elevator doors open, you're like, oh, there's Major Yearwood. <laughs> because he was praising the Lord. And he'd always come, after I preached this, that Good Friday, and I'm like 30 years old, you know, gave it my best. And uh, he's a giant. So I'm sitting at my desk and Major Yearwood gets off the elevator, comes into the youth department, and uh, he towers over me at the desk, and he goes, oh, are you praising the Lord, Sister Mun? And I was like, I am now, Major Yearwood. <laughs> and then he just, he just, every time for years, I've seen him now, you know, 20 years on, every time he sees me, he remembers that little word I gave, and he goes like this, truly and properly God, truly and properly man. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. That's Jesus and we love him. So truly and properly human, truly and properly man, like he's really one of us. This I think is the part that we probably don't actually explore as fully as we might. Uh, there was in the uh, first century church at the writing of a number of the New Testament letters, the epistles, a heresy, a false doctrine that had begun to develop called docetism which actually uh, denied that God had, that Christ, it wasn't saying that Christ wasn't God, it wouldn't deny his deity, but it denied his humanity, that he had really, actually, truly come in the flesh. Because there was this understanding that flesh was evil, and uh, so that couldn't possibly be true. And this is the beauty of our Christian faith, that no, God has become one of us. How far will God go? to become a home for us, to be at home for us, he will become one of us forever. He's glorified now, that Revelation 1 picture that we saw yesterday. He's the glorified son of man, but he is still a human being. So I just want to be really clear on this about our, our doctrine for, about our understanding. We call it Christology, right? our understanding of Christ, uh, that he is truly and properly human. He's one of us forever. And then this, the, the uh, other side of that, which is also simultaneously eternally true, is that Jesus is truly and properly God forever. And when he came in the flesh, he was still God. But Philippians 2 tells us that he laid aside the privileges of deity. It wasn't that he stopped being God, but he laid aside every privilege. So what would be some of the privileges of the Godhead? Being all-knowing, everywhere present, and all-powerful. Right? Those are things that are unique to God. And Jesus Christ, during the incarnation, laid those privileges aside to be one of us. And so we see a prophecy from Isaiah fulfilled in Matthew. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, where they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, there's God for us in the Old Testament at the incarnation. Uh, there's God with us. And we're going to talk tomorrow about God on the inside of us, which would be uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's not only for us, he's not only with us, but he's actually in us. This is great. This is the mystery that's been hidden for generations, but is now revealed to the saints. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> it's been a secret for a long time, and now it's out. So we want to get a picture here of our lovesick God. Uh, this is Jesus Christ, right? Look at all the times. This sounds like, if you think about a young couple who are in love with each other, uh, that they just want to be together, want to be with each other. Look at all the times that Jesus, like who's one of us, like how far will God go to be with us, to make his home with us? Look at Jesus, our lovesick God. See the language here. He's speaking to his friends. And he says, come away, look at the phrase, with me to a quiet place. I remember seeing a young father with his little, like a three-year-old boy a few years ago, and they were kind of bickering with each other. The little boy was, seemed kind of uh, whining and so on. The father was doing his best, but they weren't really making any progress in their negotiations. <laughs> and uh, finally, I heard the little boy, about three years old, say, but Daddy, I just want to be with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, drop what you're doing. I'm yours, right? <laughs> but that's a beautiful cry, isn't it? I just want to be with you. 
And that's what Jesus is saying here to his friends. Uh, and interestingly, this he's referring to Judas at the Last Supper, my betrayer. He knew, not because he was God, because the Holy Spirit told him. Jesus said, my betrayer is with me. He's one of us. We all experience betrayal. Perhaps at times we all are betrayers. But God does not abandon us. He does not write us off and say, forget it. But right there he says, my betrayer is with me. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. And then here, toward the end in the garden, stay here with me. He's a man, he's a human, he's one of us. Stay here with me in my sorrow. He's totally one of us. We see this here in the garden. I need your company. You can't fix it, but I just want you with me. And we experience this, don't we, in just the simplicity of, if you want to call it visitation. When my, the day that my mother died, the first person who came to our house was my Sunday school teacher. Um, and uh, we just sat and cried. There's nothing she could do. But she knew she had wisdom about being with me. And then Jesus promised uh, before he left, I will come back and take you with me. You'll be with me today in paradise, he says to the thief on the cross. You'll be with me. And then finally, this, this glorious high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. Father, I want them with me where I am. When Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, in my Father's house are many rooms. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you will be also. You'll be with me. I'll come back and get you, right? He said that. As I understand it, that would have been a recognized uh, proposal offer from a Jewish uh, groom, would-be groom. But he would say to the bride, in my father's house are many rooms. I'm going to go get a room ready for you. And when it's prepared, I'll come back and bring you to my father's house that we can be together. I want to be with you. So Jesus friends, disciples, were Jews, they would have understood what he was saying. The intimacy, the commitment we talked about yesterday, and intimacy, right? Covenant precedes habitation. I want you to be with me. So Jesus is the dwelling place of God. He's gesturing to this magnificent structure in Jerusalem, the temple, and he is really prophesying truth about himself, uh, which of course confused everybody around him. But he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And that was used against him as a point of mockery. Didn't he say, destroy this temple? And now he can't even save himself on the cross, not recognizing that he was actually saying, no, I am the temple of God in a, in a very unique, in a singular way. Right? God has come into the neighborhood. And we see here in Hebrews chapter 1, he is the, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. If you want to look at some scripture passages that really emphasize the deity of God, that, I mean, deity of Jesus, that he was truly and properly God. The first few verses of John chapter one, uh, Colossians chapter one, and Hebrews chapter one, helpfully, <laughs> the same chapter, chapter one, and those three books, those three uh, books of the New Testament, really uh, give us a lot of insight into the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ, that he was truly and properly God. Often in the writings of uh, John, both the Gospel of John, and in the letter, the epistles of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, uh, John actually zooms in about this heresy, about docetism, which says that he wasn't really a human. Remember, you recognize we don't really usually preach on this very much, which is probably okay, <laughs> that John, uh, in, I think it's 1st John, said that any spirit that doesn't acknowledge that Jesus has come in the flesh is the Antichrist, is not of God. He was actually coming against the heresy of saying that. So Jesus said of himself, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. A home for our homeless God. How far will God go to make himself at home with us? He made himself vulnerable, and he is still vulnerable. He still suffers. My daughter and I were talking last night about uh, some of the profanity, like profaneness toward Jesus Christ in the world today, like really intentionally profaning, not just unbelief, but really foul things. And just that Jesus is, he's still vulnerable, like he still would feel, he's, he's a, eternally human, plus God has emotions as well, so that divine side of him also, that he would still, he's still vulnerable, he still feels pain, he still experiences rejection. 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He came to his own, here's the rejection piece, but his own did not receive him. But to those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I want to receive that fully, right? Thank you, Jesus. So here we go, a little review, incredible shrinking home of God. The whole earth, right? Adam and Eve in the garden, make yourself at home. I've got it all ready for you. It's beautiful. Rebellion, hiding, they're not walking with God even in paradise. The flaming swords with angels across Eden, they're cast out. God saying, no, I really want to be at home with you human beings. Abram, I'll bless your family. I'll make you a great nation. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Rebellion, rejection. Okay, I'll come into the neighborhood in the middle of the camp in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, and then in Jerusalem in the temple. I want to be in the midst of the community with my glory, with my presence. Rebellion, rejection. Okay then, I'll send my son. I will come myself, fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. I will come to you. How far will God go to make himself at home with us? I'd like to share with you a scripture presentation from Isaiah 53 and Philippians chapter 2. And just let the truth of the word wash over you with regard to this question, how far will God go? Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by people, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom we hide our faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God and afflicted, smitten by him. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By knowledge of him, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to hold on to, but he emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is a painting by Rembrandt. I can't say it the way the Dutch do. <laughs> and uh, Henry Nouwen has written a book inspired by this painting. And it's a, the prodigal, right? It's the image of uh, the father in the story from Luke 15 of the prodigal son. Is it Luke 15 or Luke 10? Anyway, so there's the father welcoming home the prodigal son. Uh, and we've talked about home, right? God earnestly desiring to make a home for us and be at home with us and for us to bring his presence everywhere we go. Pursuing us, pursuing us, pursuing us, facing rejection and vulnerability and suffering. And yet he pursues us relentlessly in his love. And he does to this day. We have no doubt this is the Father's heart, right? I think it's Peter writes in the New Testament uh, some some like complain like why is God so slow in hanging action it says it's he is not slow as some understand it but wanting none to perish but all to come into eternal life so we're going to take a few minutes now and uh, intercede join in the great intercessions of the high priest Jesus Christ and actually cry out to God and this might you might even this might be you that it's your time to come home so there's a song from um, Les Mis bring him home and who doesn't like musicals <laughs> Well, don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> but uh, we're going to listen. It's a prayer from Les Mis, and it's a, sort of a father figure praying for who would become his son-in-law. Uh, but let's intercede. And I want to invite you, if this, is, if this is you, that you actually recognize, I don't think I've ever really come home to God who loves me, who's been pursuing me. I see it now all my life. He's been after me. He's never given up on me. I recognize now that Jesus has paid the price so dearly for me truly and properly God and truly and properly human, really one of us, and he wants to be with me. Uh, that the mercy seat is open for you now, this morning, and I want to invite you to come home. As we're, we're going to listen to the song, Bring Him Home, it's a prayer as I mentioned, but also that if that's for you, please uh, welcome home. Come home now, hey? Uh, but also, everyone in the room, we need to have people on our hearts for whom we are praying. And we are saying, oh God, would you bring them home? Would you bring them home? We know that you're pursuing, you're pursuing, you're pursuing. Would you open the eyes of their heart? Give them more light, light of the world. Help them to see the light of the gospel, the glory of God in the face of Christ. Tear off the blinders. Would you do it, Father? And we're asking not only for individuals, uh, but even neighborhoods and communities. What's on your heart? Perhaps nations, I don't know. Who's on your heart that when you say, who do I long to see come home? to the Father. We're going to pray now. We're going to join in the intercessions of the great high priest, the Lord Jesus, and cry out to God, bring them home. Okay? So the mercy seat is open. We're going to listen to the song, and uh, you are invited, please, uh, to come home to the Father even now. It is for you. Have no doubt it is for you, and also for every one of us here to cry out to God, bring them home. Okay? We're going to continue in prayer. And let's all be uh, exercising our faith for one another, right? There should be no one in the room who's detached, whose heart is not engaged, whose heart is not engaged in the cry of the Father. Come home. I have sent myself in my only begotten Son to pay the price. The body has been torn, the curtain opened for you, a new and living way. We're going to sing this chorus from a songbook. Come home. You who are weary, come home earnestly, tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, all of us. Come home. If you want to find somebody in the room and to pray out loud, to or pray together, uh, we don't have to, but you're you're invited to do that. Please feel freedom uh, to find somebody, whether it's someone near you, or you want to get up and find someone in the room. Uh, let's unite together in prayer. How about this for uh, a spiritual bucket list thing? that out of this Western Bible Conference 2013, there would be a great homecoming 
a great harvest of people who have been in rebellion, who have wandered off. It'd be a remarkable homecoming. We'd be hearing for weeks and months, maybe years to come. You're like, wow, it's the Isaac laugh. Really? That happened? They've come home? That we would see this release of redemptive energy and the power of God through what happens right here today. Right? We are in partnership with the Most High God. He invites us into intercession, right? Bring him home. He says, join with me. Would you agree with me? Jesus, our intercessor, is saying, would you agree with me in prayer that God would call home the wanderer, call home the lost, open the eyes of the blind, heal the brokenhearted. We have a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Come home. So we're going to sing together, but again, feel freedom uh, to pray together. We're, we, we agree together by faith in the word of the Lord.